Good evening, welcome, and uh, um, thank you very much for uh, inviting uh, me tonight to make a short introduction and uh, probably to moderate the discussion. After we are now not just in the Zoom, we are at the sixth um, session of the lecture series that Campus Gegenwart organized this semester. And it has a wonderful title, Commons for Wem is die Kunst? And uh, I assume that the first word in English is the answer to the second phrase question in German. And, uh, or at least I hope it is like this. So the, um, the great pleasure is um, to introduce, uh, also to welcome um, to this talk, the uh, tactical tech and um, the represented today by Marek Tajinski. Good evening, man. Thank you that uh, you could make it um, tonight. The tactical, let's just say a few words. I think the tactical tech is uh, um, amazing and a very important organization, non-governmental organization, the organization with the history that uh, uh, actually 20 years old history yeah? if we count from the moment when you got the idea and it's uh, to to work with tech tech uh, tactically and uh, a little bit younger as a registered organization and through for all this uh, years you were making work that was uh, like ex expiring other organization activists and uh, uh, individual people actually to question all the time yeah the tools um, that are given to us the um, to uh, yeah and i would also like to tell that working you worked like i don't know with data before it became big data yeah <laughs> and also so the you were attracting attention to what could go wrong long oh, before yeah, things yeah. got completely yeah. long before things got completely wrong <laughs> there is a um, uh, you are, the work is going in many directions, the exhibition project, educational projects, consulting, there is a podcast, very uh, also, I would say, immersive one. I really hope that tonight you will introduce the projects and also maybe explain what's how to, what were these 20 years for the organization itself. Yeah, so please, yeah, now... Gabriel, turn off my microphone and let's listen to Marek. Hi, everyone. Uh, oh, yeah, thank you so much. This is such a nice introduction that makes me feel very sentimental. I'm like thinking about different <laughs> things that were nice and not nice in the history and also make me feel very old. So I don't want everybody to feel like uh, there's a Gandalf coming and it's not tell you the ancient history of uh, uh, net art and net activism and so on, which I probably could actually, uh, but this is not the, the purpose of the talk. And I will narrow it actually. I want to talk a lot about, I, make, I may make some reflections about time, but I would try to focus on how we go about investigating the digital, why are we doing it? And then I would focus on one project, how we trying to, because I'm speaking in the context of commons, how we try to create a ten temporary spaces um, that become kind of, in a way, commons, because they run by a community of people um, that we invite and they open the space for the audiences to, to, to come to the spaces and uh, explore things that it's very hard to explore somewhere else. There are no spaces in which you can do that. They are kind of colonized to, to abuse the word for a second. So instead of going back to you know the history, who we are, how we work, etc., I'm just going to jump instantly into some of the investigations. Um, and I call them investigations. However, they have different outputs. So I'm going to use outputs like you know a, a sculpture, a video, and uh, an infographic, and you name it. Um, many of these outputs 
have multiple formats. But I would focus on about how you go about um, investigating what you're trying to tell. Um, because for us, what is very important in the education work, awareness raising, the kind of more creative work, is to make sure that our work is factual, is evidence-based, and is also practice-based. So as much as we love speculating, and people often think that we show things that are futuristic or not possible, not happening, and so on, unfortunately, always the case is that they do. Um, so the first example is called uh, trachography, and we will try to watch a short animation, which has a kind of annoying sound, scratching, very Berlin-like, so bear with me and let's see if that's going to work. And then I give you a context to that one. So let's go. I can actually stop it here um, because the link is to the older website and uh, I can give you the link to the new website. So this is just an example of, um, it is easy to say, oh, there are trackers and they do this and that and so on. But people want to know, is, is it a lot of them? Who, who owns them? Uh, where they appear or not appear? Why they're invisible and so on, etc. So we work with Claudio Agosti, which is a programmer and a journalist and a researcher who written the code for this investigation. Uh, we asked partners in 38 countries to run this software 
and it was like a piece of software that would uh, look at the list of media that they submitted themselves with URLs of the media outputs per, per each of the countries. And it would visit this website and it would scrape all the trackers possible. So either hidden in advertisement, hidden in icons, uh, or hidden in, in, in code of, of the website itself. Um, like for example, Google Analytics is. And, um, and then it would look at uh, where each of these trackers is taking the data. So first of all, what kind of information they collect, because you can see that, and then where it goes, where the, where the server uh, that the tracker owner sits is base and we were kind of inspired by the old school photography where um on the on the metro there's a, a person reading a newspaper and there's five people looking you know over the shoulder uh, to read that news etc and that was already kind of you know uh, funny uh in, in some way <laughs> Uh, but we were thinking about okay now it's even that somebody can actually look over your shoulder on your screen but there's other side of the screen there's many other eyes out there that are looking at very precisely not only what you're reading when you're reading uh, for, for how long and so on the basic kind of metadata of the information but also what topics you are interested in um, what is the cross what kind of types of media you're visiting uh, so what is your political leaning all these kind of nuances that you can extract from accumulated data set and so forth. And this project is a static project, so it doesn't allow you to put the new URL, et cetera. It's kind of documenting a process of uh, scanning this over 2000 news websites uh, from 38 countries. And we wanted to show that it is not unique. We wanted to show that uh, we depend on the infrastructure in certain countries like US. We depend on big players like Google and, and Facebook, and they have different reasons for collecting data. Since we did this project, a lot of change as well. Uh, we know more about how the profiles of people are being used or abused by you know entities like Cambridge Analytica and so on so that was one kind of an investigation let's look at the infrastructure through basically jumping inside and seeing uh, through technological skills how the actual information is uh, flowing uh, through the through this infrastructure and the rest you, you read the, in the in the animation i'm going to re repeat myself this is another investigation that i wanted to show there's no video here uh, this is an investigation that we did together with Joanna Moll, who is a spanish artist uh, based in between i think right now Barcelona and berlin very often who investigates also kind of the nuances and other side of, of of technology and what we did this time the approach was different um, we talk a lot about uh, profiles that profiles can be sold and bought and, and so on. Uh, but what would happen if you actually bought some profiles? Is it easy to buy them? Uh, what you can buy, what's inside, and so on, etc. cetera. So um, that was a little adventure uh, that we started with Viana, where we bought 1 million online dating profiles for 136 euro from USDATE. USDATE is an official website. We didn't use any dark web uh, or you know anonymous credit cards or anything we just you know went to the website choose what you want click ok pay 136 euro and we downloaded the the data set in the comma separated val value you know normal standard way of uh, of data what was in that data was kind of more interesting because it wasn't just name and uh, some basic stuff um, in this one million profiles we got five million photographs uh, of photographs that people posted to dating sites and so on there were also email addresses you know all the personal information from like nationality gender age uh, preferences uh, physical characteristics and you name it uh, a lot of uh, information and then the the process we went about it was first of all how to show show and problematize the politics of what actually is happening where you enter a service that is asking you for additional information about yourself so it can serve you better service and in this case better dating experience so you can find matches and so on etc and the project has two phases um joanna went for exploring the visual side of the project with the auction and uh, this is the left side of the screen where if you go to the url uh, you, you will be presented with the current auction there'll be different number this one this is a screenshot from some time ago where you will be offered to see profiles of certain kinds of people. In this case, we have uh, people who speak Dutch, one, don't want children, 
uh, and so on. And then you enter the space, and I'm going to talk about it in a few seconds. But the other part of the of the project was to actually follow the traces that you can extract from this data set. So, for example, images, the five million images had uh, metadata about you know who created it, when it was created, because they use the same kind of a format for um, names of files, if you like. And it was very clear that the that, that data came from specific places. And so US date basically led us and Joanna to actually discovering the entire kind of a big plot of uh, companies. So first of all, the number of them from whom this data was uh, collected. Then, then we learned that actually the major player was a uh, match group, which we thought maybe that was the major one. And a match group owns, you know, Tinder, okay, cookies, plenty of fish, match, and I don't know, 20 other dating websites. And there's much more of them right now. This is project from 2018. And then when you look at who owns Match Group, then you learn that it's also Interactive Corporation or IAC that owns Match Group and a few other different kinds of things. And you can explore that. I'm not going to kind of tell you because it's kind of a, a, a nuanced story. But what we figure out uh, through Johanna's investigation that there was basically 700 interconnected companies involved in trading, exchanging, accessing uh, these data sets of people. And what, what was interesting to see uh, through analyzing the metadata of this information, that in many of these outfits, the same data was presented, regardless of the fact that the person may have only uh, signed up for one of them. So what, what we discover also that they were exchanged between sites. So new websites that were new in the business of dating owned by the same companies create this kind of you know um, impression of competition impression of you know diversity and so forth etc but they would start from the same data set without consent and knowledge of people who started at another dating site so my profile for example on tinder if i had one i could find it in other places as well without uh, actually ever accessing them but I would not be able to access it because obviously it wasn't done by me, so I had no access to it. But it would be presented to people uh, to kind of uh, stimulate um, interaction uh, and so on, etc. So that led to a kind of hoo-ha with some of the companies. Um, and it was also interesting to see, adding what we learned from the previous investigation, that there's a core business, that there's a number of small number of companies that own the entire network of subsidiaries that are pretending to be independent entities that are helping people you know with something that is important in this case is dating socializing and, and so on etc it's become even more important during COVID, i believe uh, but there's an, another layer on the top of that of this uh, trackers that they obviously the reason they do that is also to make money and the business model here is not different to the business model we were looking at before which is uh, profiling people and giving access to these profiles through advertisement. Um, and there are hundreds of different, as we learned from the previous project uh, that I showed you, trackers present at these websites. So this is uh, how the auction looks like. Uh, you can go to one auction, you're going to be presented with all the profiles. When you click on the profile, I just choose one here that is enlarged. You can see all the information. They anonymize, so you don't, you don't see names, um, specific cities just country and you cannot search the data the idea here was as with any other project was to protect the the users let's use this name for a second um and not victimize people for whatever they can uh, have done wrong because they didn't done anything wrong um but rather focus on what we can learn from that so there also there's a yellow box at the bottom that you can report if you can recognize somebody it's going to be remove or anonymize and so on. But the reason that you can't really find anything here is that you can only follow auctions. You can't search the database. And this is when we make decisions where we publish the data that we have access to. And when we decide not to publish the data that we have, if it would in any way compromise or, or put at danger people who, who are represented with the data set. So that's the second investigation uh, that is accessible to these two, two formats follow the steps we we uncover 
uh, uh, things behind data and dating sites or explore the visual aspect of it and look at uh, the artistic exploration. And uh, another story we wanted to tell since I don't know how long, probably six years ago, was to somehow illustrate the omnipresence of Google. Because a lot of focus is there on Facebook and other social media right now and so on, also owned by Facebook, like WhatsApp or Instagram, etc. And kind of more and more people know now that those are the bad kids on the block. But Google is still able to play this kind of neutral, um, interesting game. Um, so we were thinking how we can show how big actually Google is. What is Google nowadays comparing to 1998 when they started? And um, are there any entry points for investigation to see uh, where they're going? Because you know, we won't learn that. We can only, from the corporations, all we learn is the PR. And uh, research is very limited because it's only happening when they allowed researchers or disallowed researchers for, from exploring how they actually operate work and so on, etc. And then we have to wait for whistleblowers. We, we have some, you've seen recently uh, from Facebook, but we don't have anything uh, mm, yet from, from Google. So what we decided to do was to look at something very basic that uh, actually recently uh, also uh, Wall Street Journal did, I think, uh, Washington Post actually, which is to look at the acquisitions. So this is the first take on the right here when you try to make the sculpture of the timeline of all the acquisitions and investments that uh, Google made or then Alphabet um, since 1998. So we are looking at total of around 600 companies, uh, 200 acquisitions and 400 investments, and we are trying to group them into categories. So. Google may be known by 10 different largest products, but you know, 600 is more than 10. And by grouping them into categories, we can think about through the investment, what they're looking for. And obviously they're looking for outsmart the competition, probably they're looking for buying talent, you know, brain drain so-called. They're looking for uh, buying good code that would, that's often happening in the, in the sector as well, that would increase their potential in given sectors, you know, AI, VR, you name it. Um, and, and they also want to dominate certain sectors. So you can also look at, you know, what is the niche? What is different between Google and Facebook where they are very different and when they overlap, what is the competition and so on. So that was the first approach. It was nice, but we were, we were not very happy. Then we created this uh, larger infographic uh, where the size of the bubble also shows you the amount of money. But then we had to actually speculate a lot, which we don't like to do, as I said at the beginning, because this information is not available. So first of all, not every amount of money is being disclosed. Sometimes it's disclosed incidentally because there's an interview with Eric Schmidt and he says this and that, and then we say, okay, this is, let's capture that number. But it's never registered anywhere. There's no like a place in the world where you could go and see even if you go to uh, specialized databases which we did and i can show you later how we go about it you can't find this information it's just not existent and also how they describe these companies is pure pr they, they don't necessarily say what they actually do why they buy them uh, you know for what purposes and so on etc they use this kind of you know pr language that is very vague if you like and we kind of play with the quote here from eric schmidt you know we know where you are because the idea was okay, let's let's explore it. Let's let's see, you know, that actually their investment in health is much bigger than anybody would have thought. And we never consider actually Google to be a company focusing on that kind of things. We kind of heard about robotics. We kind of heard about education through Chrome and uh, Chromium and so on, etc. So that was very nice, but it was impossible to update. So then we went for another model because actually the idea was to show that there's nothing wrong with these companies to buy other companies. This is what every single company in the world corporation does. So that wasn't that kind of catching for, for people. This is the object we did for two years ago based on the same data set. So at the bottom ring, you have all the companies that they invested and kind of, you know, com compatibilize. The 10 layers, like the cake layers are representing the 10 services that Google uh, Alphabet owns that have more than 1 billion users. Some of them have more than 4 billion users, like 
Android, for example, is for 4.2, and you can find this data. And that was interesting for us because if you're looking at a corporation that has at least 10 services that uh, have access to data of the users, uh, and each of them is bigger than 1 billion, some are even bigger than four. Um, and when you think about how many people are there using the internet globally, which is about 5 billion right now, uh, you may think that basically Google, through some or another way, can see almost everyone on the internet. And then if you look at also these 600 different other services, etc., the probability that they have different avenues to, to, like, to look at our data in transit, to look at our profiles, to, to kind of you know, extract behaviors from that is, is huge comparing to any other corporation that we've been looking at. So we created this kind of you know, cake-like thing with the bottom layer of people there, transparent people and so on. But um, it was beautiful. People put it on Instagram, but it didn't really convey the, the information. So then finally we created this object for this year, which is, we decided that actually the story here is, I'm just telling you a really boring story about how you go about creative process to figure out the proper narrative that you're happy with. So we ended up with this object that is showing and we call this object not Google Empire, not anything else we called it before, but this is what we call Google Society. And it's a, it's a kind of a irony in the title, um, where we move the 10 applications, the 10, 10 bigger services like Maps, Android, uh, Photos, uh, Gmail, YouTube, etc., to be surfacing on the kind of fictional uh, mobile phone that is a mirror. And then from that, you have the strings coming out and we divided them into uh, categories that lie over the acquisitions and uh, uh, investments of google and so on on the other side what happens this is the data set if you're interested what we're showing uh, i think what is important that we show uh, in this piece is the the growth of the revenue from advertisement that is the number four because there's a link between how it is possible for google to uh, earn so much money by giving other companies access to people profiles, which is 150 billion in uh, 2020, uh, because that gives the, the financial power to the corporations to be able to do other things like acquire other businesses. So different kinds of competition if you have such a big wallet, but also to spend a lot of money on, for example, lobbying um, and so on, etc. Um, and there's a direct link about the growth of to how much access they have to, to the information and so on. On the other side, we presented this view of how this world of personal data looks like from Google perspective. So it kind of, you can probably think that it looks like an iris and uh, there's no mistake here. And we kind of showed the major kinds of learnings that Google can uh, extract from the data they collect. So one thing is the business model, which is, you, can, you may not mind, um, that is people usually say, I don't care what advertisement I see because I don't click on it anyway, but that is not the problem that we're looking at. The, the profiling has a very different implications, politically speaking, than you clicking or not clicking on the advertisement. I think the possibility of uh, measuring and monitoring our behavior through different layers of how it can be seen, how we use, uh, how we kind of mediate our relationship with other people, with environment and so on, etc., through digital means, through majority of it goes to Google, is an interesting proposition to look at. So that's that's a kind of a sculpture. Um, and the last investigation I want to show you here was based actually on the report uh, from another organization where we're looking at that what is the dynamic here? So we don't want to say that we are so dependent on technology because um, we are you know, this or that, but it's more about look at again, something that we don't pay attention to, which is how is it designed? What are the tricks? What are the uh, schemes and methods used um, that makes us so dependent from, for example, mobile phone? And I'm gonna play a short video here again. Six easy steps to get us addicted to our phones. What are the most common design tricks used to addict us to our apps? 
Who's responsible for the way that we interact with our technology? And should we be blaming ourselves for not putting down our phones? We all know that warm, fuzzy feeling when someone likes your post. Simple design tactics can feed into this sense of being wanted, even if it's just to know that someone is typing a response. What do you feel when you see the typing bubble, the red confirmation, or that your photo has been liked? True stories take six times longer to reach people than fake ones. And if the story is worth reading, then who really cares if it's true or not? The point is that emotionally charged content gets clicks. And whether it's a cute cat, gifts, celebrity breakups, or a life hack, the internet is made of these bite-sized chunks of information. How easily would you follow a meme or clickbait? Did you know that what you see has been tested on thousands of people to find the best possible image, the most irresistible title to get you to click on it? friends or just followers. There's not much of a difference because we're all social creatures. Who doesn't want to be liked? Quantifying friends and interactions means that we will spend more time online so that we can nurture and extend our social circle. How often do you check how many people follow you? How often do you want to retweet, reblog, or forward to all of your followers to increase your own status? Whether hanging out with friends online or in a game, nobody wants to feel left out. Designing apps as social hubs with all the joys and fears of everyday life means that you want to stay involved. You don't want to miss out on new trends like stickers, limited releases, offers, and other rewards. Everyone else is there. What are they doing? If you're not there, you might miss out. Sound and movement create a strong sense of urgency. Being available involves all the senses. Notifications come with movement and sounds, and they pop up to distract you through all your interconnected devices. And they're good at finding you in those moments when you're just thinking what to do next. There's no dead end on the internet. Frictionless design combined with bottomless content means that we can stay online for hours without even thinking about it. Autoplay will make it easier to select the next irresistible thing to watch. Infinite scrolling will satisfy your need for rewarding content. Pull to refresh is like a nice surprise waiting for you in every loading of the screen and there is always the next thing to do have get see or achieve the makers of apps content and platforms rely on our constant attention this entire ecosystem depends on keeping us engaged value is assessed by how many users services have what users do on their platform and how often. Engineers, designers, and psychologists work together to make sure that we are constantly drawn in, designing for addiction. Does it matter how our data is used to nudge us, provoke us, and form our habits? Do we mind that our attention is turned into value? Is the instant reward worth the total sharing of our online likes, dislikes, habits, and behaviors? And are we to blame for not putting down our phones? Or have we been hooked? So that was, again, uh, an investigation that you see the result of. That is a kind of a specific storytelling. And we're moving between two kind of uh, narratives here. One is to, uh, because what we are interested in as individuals is what's my stake there? You know, what I'm doing, what I'm not doing, why I'm doing it, and so on, et cetera. But with the Google Society and other things, we try to also raise the other issue. And this project I'm going to focus on now, the, five, the fifth case, um, is looking at kind of, you know, societal, um, perspective, because um, when you focus on the individual, you kind of play the game that was designed for us to play, but it's worth to look at uh, outside of the instructions at the same game setup and see what other games are there um, that are played behind our back in some other way. So this is the project that we recently did because it's related obviously to to COVID, um, but the idea came before COVID, uh, in incidentally, it was about technology and crisis. We had no idea when we were designing this project that you know it, the the world will give us uh, an interesting case study and uh, and, uh, and a lot of uh, data that we can work with. So um, Steph, who is the co-founder of the organization, and myself, we started this project um, thanks to the grant from Onassis Foundation um, that is called the Technologies of Hope and Fear: 100 Pandemic Technologies, and we created a database of over right now we like 300 different types of technologies. And that were designed and proposed and promoted as different kinds of solutions to, I would say, problems that COVID or the pandemic caused in different ways. And we decided to explore them in a very different way, not to focus on technical aspect of the technology. So like, okay, this is the drone technology, this is the scanners, this is blah, blah, whatever that usually is being 
are described like this um, in different places, but focus on uh, different things. So try to group them into different categories, how the makers think about the kind of a data level. And we decided not to use the data as a, as a kind of a descriptor, because we thought there's something in, when you talk about data that is fairly uninteresting, boring, neutral, and, and kind of opaque, that it doesn't make us feel anything about what's going on with data. So instead, we started using the language that also the companies use themselves more and more often these days, which is intelligence. And uh, because when you talk about intelligence, then, then you have different connotation. And it's just a kind of a game gameplay here. So what we did um, uh, is, a, is an online based project where you can uh, explore all the hundreds of uh, we only choose 100 out of the 300 because the point was not to create never finished database of new products and so on. The idea was to have enough of these products that can tell us the story about different kinds of uh, approaches and so on. And that's the interesting part. So you invited to go there and look at this random set of sentences and uh, coming from the uh, companies, this is how they promote their solutions. Uh, or you can follow our narrative, but you can follow this for major topics, which is uh, observing, sensing, mitigating, and modifying. What you will be exploring is looking at four different kinds of ways of, of how technology is being used and promoted to be used to solve problems uh, uh, that came out of the of this specific pandemic. So ambient intelligence, this is the kind of a technology that you know usually have access to larger quantities of, of data or intelligence, if you like. Those who use satellites, those who have access to big pipes of data that goes to social media and so on. And it's not necessarily directed at individuals, it's more about observing larger patterns, observing larger types of behaviors and so on, et cetera, that you can read like mobility or in the cities related to certain conditions and so on. The other category that we thought is actually growing in intensely now was the biometric intelligence. And as observing is from a distance, the biometric intelligence is through sensors, you know, bracelets and other attachments to the human body that can extract different kinds of, um, um, how they call it, you know, vital information uh, through sound, skin, testing, uh, also using already existing technologies for different purposes like the well-being trackers. Uh, because you can, you know, by the end of the day, you can see that your quantified body is generating different set of data when you are healthy, and then it's changing when you may become less healthy, like and so on. So they try to promote them also as a early warning system and so on, etc. And those are kind of fairly passive. This is one is from above, the other one is close to us, and the biometric one. Um, but we decide in a way through behavior or through uh, wearing different uh, sensors to, to, to use them. The other two are equally interesting, but very different. They are much more active. Uh, mobility intelligence is about mitigating issues. So the major learning from this kind of investigation was that the technology that we were looking at is not designed to fight the, the, the pandemic itself. You know, there are some technologies like you know vaccination or um, <clears throat> more scientific ways of understanding what the virus is, how it works, how it operates, what can happen, and so on, that are addressing virus itself. That is kind of ephemeral to any other technology that we're looking at because the only way for this kind of technology to see what's happening with the virus is to uh, control, monitor, analyze the host, not the virus itself. And mobility intelligence is about uh, controlling the, the virus through controlling the host uh, in different spaces, in different times. So it's about you know, movement, quarantine, access to places, controlling lockdown and so on, etc., where it can be attached to infrastructures, buildings, uh, elevators, you know, in spaces, public spaces, and so on. It also can fly over in the form of drone, as we've seen in many places like India and so on, etc., used by police. And the last type of the kind of a category of this technology that we've been looking at is behavioral intelligence. So the technology used to change the behavior of the host to improve through, you know, hygiene is one of the good examples the, the how we you know wearing a mask is a, is a very clear example here and the mask can be also intelligent that is stopping us from our body from doing something or doing something but in a very different way and so on etc so that was the major uh, 
investigation, but then the investigation also uh, show us other trends in technology, such as uh, pivot or the fact that uh, digital technologies are looking for problems to uh, to sell the technology. So they may be designed for very different purposes. And the idea is not about solving a problem. The idea is about promoting certain kinds of uh, com computational thinking. And then it is applied to any possible problem whenever it appears to justify the technology itself. So technology is looking for problems. Um, and then we were also looking at the growth of the, you know, the, the relationship between public and private, where the private and the examples you've seen before, like Google, uh, through access to uh, all these types of intelligence may have much better understanding of certain processes in the society versus any other entities, institutions, organizations, or governments for that matter. Um, and the, the, the other interesting thing we're looking at is also what kind of visual language, what kind of visual narratives these companies are using to convince us uh, to use or to convince us that their solution is better than other people's solution and so on. And that's interesting way of uh, to look at this. So you can always look at the images in the, in the data set there. Uh, mostly taken from from the either videos or promotions of these products to see how interestingly they use the layer of visual language that is designed by humans to represent how we should think computer can see things so a lot of like you know infrared different spectrum so all these kind of things and it kind of gives you the sense of empowering or adding superpowers to individuals institutions as well to see through things that we as humans have no senses uh, and no history of actually being able to process um, this kind of information because it doesn't you know get to our brains and uh, we need technology for that uh, so it's a very, very interesting narrative and so i'm not gonna dwell on it i'm just kind of running out of time i believe so i'm gonna speed up so those were kind of different formats of just to show you how we go about understanding the the digital world and the overlay between the the digital and non-digital and mostly focusing on the impact of technology on society in different ways and we try to also speak the language that is not complicated talking about technology is usually complicated and boring and very technological so we try to avoid that uh, we try to create objects, as you've seen, animations, posters, uh, 3D objects, and so on, etc., that explore different possibilities for the audience to engage with the topics. Uh, that is often tactile, it's often uh, process based. And we also work with a lot of artists, etc. I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to show anything like this. Maybe I will. So, um, this is how the exhibit may look like, and the different models, and so on. And the exhibit. Um, we call it the classroom. This is just one project I wanted to kind of show you here, which is the way for us to show the investigations. They have also other formats. We would write reports, of course, uh, you know, articles, etc. But they written for specific, very narrow audiences that really are interested in the topics. The exhibition is mostly made for people who are, in a way, indifferent, uninterested, and not necessarily have time and energy to engage with these topics. Uh, so we try to find a way, either through culture jamming, to kind of breaking the, the borders between you don't actually know where you're coming in, what you're going to be exploring. And then we try to format the, the experience in such a way that, as you can see, people are genuinely interested. This is just an example of what we, we do with the big classroom, where we created this. This is a London one, uh, where we hijack the aesthetics and the idea of basically Apple Store. Um, or any other large uh, corporation that is selling technology. Um, and we replace all the content with the content that we think should be in such a place. So it is like a, one of the biggest streets in London, in this case, in Leicester Square, where, where you go for shopping, for coffee, for cinema, for theater. It's like people gather, there's plenty of museums around and so on. And then you see this space that looks like, um, you know, cool design, new things, or maybe you know new version of Apple Store. Maybe I can get an Apple a new phone there and so on. And then you enter the space and you experience different types of content. Some of this content is based on the investigations I just showed you. Some of it is based on the artworks that the artists we work with agreed to present it as as a kind of a devices and it's presented in such a way as you could experience them in the shop, not in the gallery. And some other are already made. So we use a lot of existing videos that are created by the companies themselves we, we, we don't comment on them and so on um, some examples of how we go about also bringing a little bit of 
dark humor into the exhibition. This is the uh, piece called Notes of Apology Tour we did about uh, Mark Zuckerberg. As you know, a few years ago, he had to show up at the uh, uh, Congress in the US to testify uh, during the scandal with the Cambridge Analytica, where uh, Facebook enabled the company to access personal data of people that was used there for manipulating their participation in the election process. And so what we did, we did two things. So we did this uh, Rolodex in which we uh, collected every single, you know, apology, acknowledgement, lessons learned, pledges, promises that Zuckerberg made since, you know, whenever Facebook was created, always responding to critique or responding to mistakes or responding to things that would compromise the trust of the users to the platform. And we put also all the questions that have been asked uh, into the Rolodex as well, so you can look at them because there, there was the opinion that policymakers did not know what questions they asked, but actually when you look at them, those are the questions that everybody would ask. This is what we as users think about this technology, it's not just uh, people who are sitting in Congress. And next to it on the right side, there's the two pieces of, uh, do I have a bit of a picture? Yeah, on the right side here, um, what happened during this session was that um, a reporter was able to take a picture of cheat sheet. So Zuckerberg has this, had these two A4 pieces of paper in which uh, his advisors and himself written different things like how to talk about data safety, how to talk about business models, uh, how to you know um, address their uh, well-being and so on, etc. So he was ready for being interrogated in, in this uh, kind of a categories, how to position Facebook against a competition and so on, etc. And he forgot to take it when they took a break. And somebody ran into the space and took the two papers. And then the photographer took the picture, you know, high resolution, and we reproduced this based on the photograph, uh, where you, sometimes you don't see things because there were the fingers of the person running away with it and so on. But it's a verbatim copy of that. And for us, it was enough to create this kind of little installation for people to explore the relationship between how the, the CEO of the you know, company at Trouble is prepared for answering questions and so on. It's kind of a blueprint for people how to you know, defend a corporation under threat, if you like, and compare it with all the acknowledgement, apologies, lessons learned, promises, and so on, and the questions asked. And that was kind of an open space for the for people to explore. Um, we also work with uh, artists. I'm not I'm sure if I should, maybe Gabriel is not making sad face. So maybe I should talk more about the other objects of other people. So just to give you a sense how you try to engage uh, uh, working with artists as well, because this is a very important part of the process that we work with. Um, this is the case of Dries de Porter, which is a Belgian artist, and the work is called Jaywalking. Um, it, what you can see, you can understand very quickly. Uh, it has a screen, you can see the crossroad, and you can see red, green light, and somebody crossing or not crossing uh, that uh, traffic lights. And then uh, you are being proposed through this work that whenever you see a person crossing on red, which is what is called jaywalking, uh, you can press the button. When you press the button, the photography screenshot is taken uh, of a given person crossing on red and the uh, anonymous email using anonymous service is sent to the police station reporting the person crossing on red. And that work creates a lot of interesting dynamic between the, the visitor who is giving this kind of tool that is fairly problematic because people are not sure. So there are different interactions. So some people stay away, don't even come close because they don't want to take part in this uh, strange process of uh, uh, surveying other people. Uh, <clears throat> other people actually are ready to report and they're waiting for somebody to cross, you know, spending minutes uh, over the button waiting for the person crossing on red. Uh, other people come in and try to break the, uh, the, the system by clicking as many times as possible. And that is interesting because that's the surface, surface dynamic. The story behind it is, is, is more interesting. Uh, so one story is about you know how 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 do you uh, participate in a, in the process of moderating content? Here you're moderating content for police, um, and you have a help of algorithm where the algorithm is telling you actually oh, it is red now, it's green now, and also can detect person crossing the the uh, the crossing. Uh, the, the interesting story that uh, it causes when you start discussing the piece is that. By the end of the day, the person, the agency of the person in front of the button uh, is irrelevant because the algorithm 
uh, can report the person crossing by itself. It doesn't need the interaction. The interaction is giving you a, a kind of an, kind of empowers you to do something, but you're not necessarily needed to to do something. It could have been done without you and so on. On the other hand, this is the same process that is happening, and I used the word moderator before because this is how you moderate content on on Facebook. You're being trained. You're being given a little manual how to you know recognize things that are okay from things that are not okay and then there's some algorithm helping you sort the the images and then you just you know report those who are bad according to the manual and let go those who are who are okay um and that's the kind of the the, the multi-layer way of interacting uh, with content that can take you to a different journey if you uh, especially if you not come along but with other people and you may have a different approach to how to think about this interaction. Um, another piece I want to show you also, which is very different because I want to show you that we also work with analog pieces, is called the Library of Missing Datasets. This is Mimi Onoha from, from New York. Uh, she created this uh, kind of a cabinet which has folders in it, and you can see what the folders are. And the concept of missing data set is, was that um, Mimi works a lot on a, a Black American, African American. Uh, politics and culture and she herself is um, black american and um, um, she was exploring not only that part of course but also the, the kind of what, what is not present uh, what is not because it's not present doesn't exist because it's not present it won't be addressed and so on etc so the idea here was to um, on her git uh, which is the kind of you know where you you collect information for some people uh, make a list of possible missing data sets. Um, and what happens when audience comes in here, the, the audience actually wants to explore the data sets, they go to the folders, they obviously empty because those are missing data sets, and so on. And then it, it, it creates this feeling that uh, I like the play that uh, uh, Mimi she uh, um, actually enables here is that the emotion is that we need to do something about it. We need to have this data set. We need to protect, you know, these people. We need to enable that, and so on, etc. But the true story here is that it is the play with this um, kind of database thinking, data thinking, open data thinking, and so on, uh, or in general, intelligence and digital data. That is, if we only could quantify something, we should quantify it because then we can learn things about it and we can solve the problems related to it, and so on. Uh, which would mean that you would have to quantify everything in different kind of ways. And it's assuming that quantification is a neutral process that uh, uh, because, you know, data and quantification is kind of scientific. So probably it's okay, it's just math. It doesn't have any bios and so on, etc. And it's also question this idea because imagine a world in which we would be able to quantify everything and anything everywhere. It is, you know, Borgesian impossible situation of the map of empire. And that is as, as big or bigger than the empire itself, and it doesn't help with anything. Uh, it just duplicates all the problems, if you like, and so on. So that's another kind of a case of a different kind of exploration into the world we're living through. Quantification, this is the classroom story. They look like this. We represent these investigations. Um, no, no, no. Um, but for me, the important part is that Again, we can only make few of these big classrooms. And this is not the purpose we're doing these investigations and we don't want to create exhibitions per se of this kind. They are beautiful, they're great, they have impact. You know, in San Francisco, we had over 23,000 people in three weeks going through these spaces, people engage, people talk to the engineers that we train, those are local experts. Um, they leave a lot of um, feedback as well, so we can learn from that and so on. But for us, the major idea is to then take these narratives that I showed you, take these investigations and make them into much more portable, much more easy to produce, easy to distribute, like, you know, posters or, or physical objects, uh, elements, and work with libraries, schools, communities, and so on, etc. And we call it kind of a classroom experience. And this is outdated data. I mean, you have to just add another 50,000 to each, I think. I just didn't replace this slide. But this is just a year and, and three months of uh, running the community editions where we work with a lot of different kinds of partners who um, either print their own version of the exhibition or we send them at very low cost. And they uh, use this uh, formats that we created and the narratives that we created to engage the public. And many of these institutions like libraries or schools are actually desperate for finding different ways of addressing 
uh, issues that that, that um, are important uh, when you talk about digital technologies the gatekeepers the impact on society and so on this is usually the triangle which is like how we understand ourselves in this entire process who are the big players and gatekeepers and how does it work and what it is being normalized what kind of things are, are being impacted by this dynamic between companies needing the users and users needing the companies in this kind of strange um, way of us experiencing amazing free um, services and and them having access to amazing amounts of and types of intelligence and so on etc so for us that's very important to actually this is where we think the project is actually working we have tons of other projects i'm not going to talk about it this is the 20 years of our history the you kind know, of can see that we move from open source and from non-profits as, as Liana said um, through info activism and digital security, quantify society is what we kind of focus on right now. But we kind of balance between addressing specific audiences, specific groups of uh, entities like human rights uh, or rights oriented organizations and activists and so on. And more and more we focus on uh, larger uh, groups. Now we also have project for youth and that I'm not going to talk about right now. No, no, no. And then we do a data detox, we do exposing the invisible, this is the podcast is there, there's plenty of different activities, I'm not going to talk about it, just thank you. I have questions, but if somebody else wants to jump in, please do turn on your microphone and... <clears throat> 